Today I'll be reading the 1982 Opinion of the Court in Nixon v. Fitzgerald. Justice Powell delivered the opinion of the court in which Chief Justice Berger and Justices Rehnquist, Stevens, and O'Connor joined. Chief Justice Berger filed a concurring opinion. Justice White filed a dissenting opinion in which Justices Brennan, Marshall, and Blackman joined. Justice Blackman filed a dissenting opinion in which Justices Brennan and Marshall joined. The plaintiff in this lawsuit seeks relief in civil damages from a former President of the United States. The claim rests on actions allegedly taken in the former President's official capacity during his tenure in office. The issue before us is the scope of the immunity possessed by the President of the United States. Part 1 In January 1970, the respondent, A. Ernest Fitzgerald, lost his job as a management analyst with the Department of the Air Force. Fitzgerald's dismissal occurred in the context of a departmental reorganization and reduction in force, in which his job was eliminated. In announcing the reorganization, the Air Force characterized the action as taken to promote economy and efficiency in the armed forces. Respondents' discharge attracted unusual attention in Congress and in the press. Fitzgerald had attained national prominence approximately one year earlier, during the waning months of the presidency of Lyndon B. Johnson. On November 13, 1968, Fitzgerald appeared before the Subcommittee on Economy and Government of the Joint Economic Committee of the United States Congress. To the evident embarrassment of his superiors in the Department of Defense, Fitzgerald testified that cost overruns on the CA transport plane could approximate $2 billion. He also revealed that unexpected technical difficulties had arisen during the development of the aircraft. Concerned that Fitzgerald might have suffered retaliation for his congressional testimony, the Subcommittee on Economy and Government convened public hearings on Fitzgerald's dismissal. The press reported those hearings prominently, as it had the earlier announcement that his job was being eliminated by the Department of Defense. At a news conference on December 8, 1969, President Richard Nixon was queried about Fitzgerald's impending separation from government service. The president responded by promising to look into the matter. Shortly after the news conference, the petitioner asked White House Chief of Staff H.R. Haldeman to arrange for Fitzgerald's assignment to another job within the administration. It also appears that the president suggested to Budget Director Robert Mayo that Fitzgerald might be offered a position in the Bureau of the Budget. Fitzgerald's proposed reassignment encountered resistance within the administration. In an internal memorandum of January 20, 1970, White House aide Alexander Butterfield reported to Haldeman that Fitzgerald is no doubt a top-notch cost expert, but he must be given very low marks in loyalty, and after all, Loyalty is the name of the game. Butterfield therefore recommended that, quote, we should let him bleed, for a while at least, unquote. There is no evidence of White House efforts to re-employ Fitzgerald subsequent to the Butterfield Memorandum. Absent any offer of alternative federal employment, Fitzgerald complained to the Civil Service Commission. In a letter of January 20, 1970, he alleged that his separation represented unlawful retaliation for his truthful testimony before a congressional committee. The commission convened a closed hearing on Fitzgerald's allegations on May 4, 1971. 
Fitzgerald, however, preferred to present his grievances in public. After he had brought suit and won an injunction, public hearings commenced on January 26, 1973. The hearings again generated publicity, much of it devoted to the testimony of Air Force Secretary Robert Siemens. Although he denied that Fitzgerald had lost his position in retaliation for congressional testimony, Siemens testified that he had received some advice from the White House before Fitzgerald's job was abolished, but the secretary declined to be more specific. He responded to several questions by invoking executive privilege. At a news conference on January 31, 1973, the president was asked about Mr. Seaman's testimony. Mr. Nixon took the opportunity to assume personal responsibility for Fitzgerald's dismissal. Quote, I was totally aware that Mr. Fitzgerald would be fired or discharged or asked to resign. I approved it, and Mr. Siemens must have been talking to someone who had discussed the matter with me. No, this was not a case of some person down the line deciding he should go. It was a decision that was submitted to me. I made it, and I stick by it. Unquote. A day later, however, the White House press office issued a retraction of the president's statement. According to a press spokesman, the president had confused Fitzgerald with another former executive employee. On behalf of the president, the spokesman asserted that Mr. Nixon had not put before him the decision regarding Mr. Fitzgerald. After hearing over 4,000 pages of testimony, the chief examiner for the Civil Service Commission issued his decision in the Fitzgerald case on September 18, 1973. The examiner held that Fitzgerald's dismissal had offended applicable civil service regulations. The examiner based this conclusion on a finding that the departmental reorganization in which Fitzgerald lost his job, though purportedly implemented as an economy measure, was in fact motivated by reasons purely personal to respondent. As this was an impermissible basis for a reduction in force, the examiner recommended Fitzgerald's reappointment to his old position or to a job of comparable authority. The examiner, however, explicitly distinguished this narrow conclusion from a suggested finding that Fitzgerald had suffered retaliation for his testimony to Congress. As found by the commission, the evidence of record does not support Fitzgerald's allegation that his position was abolished and that he was separated in retaliation for his having revealed the C-5A cost overrun in testimony before the Proxmire Committee on November 13, 1968. Following the Commission's decision, Fitzgerald filed a suit for damages in the United States District Court. In it, he raised essentially the same claims presented to the Civil Service Commission. As defendants, he named eight officials of the Defense Department, White House aide Alexander Butterfield, and one or more unnamed White House aides, styled only as John Doe's. The District Court dismissed the action under the District of Columbia's three-year statute of limitations, and the Court of Appeals affirmed as to all but one defendant, White House aide Alexander Butterfield. The Court of Appeals reasoned that Fitzgerald had no reason to suspect White House involvement in his dismissal, at least until 1973. In that year, reasonable grounds for suspicion had arisen, most notably through publication of the internal White House memorandum in which Butterfield had recommended that Fitzgerald at least should be made to, quote, bleed for a while, unquote, before being offered another job in the administration. Holding that concealment of illegal activity 
would toll the statute of limitations. The Court of Appeals remanded the action against Butterfield for further proceedings in the district court. Following the remand and extensive discovery thereafter, Fitzgerald filed a second amended complaint in the district court on July 5, 1978. It was in this amended complaint, more than eight years after he had complained of his discharge to the Civil Service Commission, that Fitzgerald first named the petitioner, Nixon, as a party defendant. Also included as defendants were White House aide Bryce Harlow and other officials of the Nixon administration. Additional discovery ensued. By March 1980, only three defendants remained, the petitioner Richard Nixon and White House aides Harlow and Butterfield. Denying a motion for summary judgment, the district court ruled that the action must proceed to trial. Its order of March 26 held that Fitzgerald had stated triable causes of action under two federal statutes and the First Amendment to the Constitution. The court also ruled that Petitioner was not entitled to claim absolute presidential immunity. Petitioner took a collateral appeal of the immunity decision to the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. The Court of Appeals dismissed summarily. It apparently did so on the ground that its recent decision in Halpern v. Kissinger, 1979, had rejected this claimed immunity defense. As this court has not ruled on the scope of immunity available to a president of the United States, we granted certiorari to decide this important issue. Part 2 Before addressing the merits of this case, we must consider two challenges to our jurisdiction. In his opposition to the petition for certiorari, Respondent argued that this court is without jurisdiction to review the non-final order in which the district court rejected petitioner's claim to absolute immunity. We also must consider an argument that an agreement between the parties has mooted the controversy. Section A. Petitioner invokes the jurisdiction of this court under 28 U.S.C. Section 1254, a statute that invests us with authority to review cases in the courts of appeals. When the petitioner in this case sought review of an interlocutory order denying his claim to absolute immunity, the Court of Appeals dismissed the appeal for lack of jurisdiction emphasizing the jurisdictional basis for the Court of Appeals' decision. Respondent argued that the district court's order was not an appealable case properly in the Court of Appeals within the meaning of Section 1254. We do not agree. Under the Collateral Order Doctrine of Cohen v. Beneficial Industrial Loan Corp., 1949, a small class of interlocutory orders are immediately appealable to the Courts of Appeals. As defined by Cohen, this class embraces orders that conclusively determine the disputed question, resolve an important issue completely separate from the merits of the action, and are effectively unreviewable on appeal from a final judgment. As an additional requirement, Cohen established that a collateral appeal of an interlocutory order must present a serious and unsettled question. At least twice before, this court has held that orders denying claims of absolute immunity are appealable under Cohen criteria. In previous cases, the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit also has treated orders denying absolute immunity as appealable under Cohen. In dismissing the appeal in this case, the Court of Appeals appears to have reasoned that petitioner's appeal lay outside the Cohen Doctrine because it raised no serious and unsettled question of law. 
This argument was pressed by the respondent, who asked the Court of Appeals to dismiss on the basis of that court's controlling decision in Halperin v. Kissinger. Under the circumstances of this case, we cannot agree that petitioner's interlocutory appeal failed to raise a serious and unsettled question. Although the Court of Appeals had ruled in Halperin v. Kissinger that the President was not entitled to absolute immunity, this Court never had so held. And a petition for certiorari in Halperin was pending in this Court at the time petitioner's appeal was dismissed. In light of the special solicitude due to claims alleging a threatened breach of essential presidential prerogatives under the separation of powers, we conclude that petitioner did present a serious and unsettled and therefore appealable question to the Court of Appeals. It follows that the case was in the Court of Appeals under Section 1254 and properly within our certiorari jurisdiction. Section B. Shortly after Petitioner had filed his petition for certiorari in this court and Respondent had entered his opposition, the parties reached an agreement to liquidate damages. Under its terms, the petitioner Nixon paid the respondent Fitzgerald a sum of $142,000. In consideration, Fitzgerald agreed to accept liquidated damages of $28,000 in the event of a ruling by this court that petitioner was not entitled to absolute immunity. In case of a decision upholding petitioner's immunity claim, no further payments would be made. The limited agreement between the parties left both petitioner and respondent with a considerable financial stake in the resolution of the question presented in this court. As we recently concluded in a case involving a similar contract, given respondent's continued active pursuit of monetary relief, this case remains definite and concrete touching the legal relations of parties having adverse legal interests. We've come to the end of Part 1 of this opinion, but don't worry, next episode we will pick up right where this episode left off. Until then, thanks for listening to What SCOTUS Wrote Us.